Hey, yep. I heard on the radio uh, the other day that you can find out what a person, what water they drank from a strand of their hair. Wow. That's the new forensics. Why would you want to? <laughs> Well, it was in, in regards to Silent Witness, you know, that show, you oh, know, that, yeah, yeah, that yeah. show about it, that they follow the new trends in forensics okay. and they put it in their show. Is that true, though? I don't know. Is I want you to find out for me. Can show? you ask that question? I would love to. I would love to. Well, that's, that's what I love know. about this place. We're going to go and meet real forensics. Yes. And how people. much that television stuff, which all is a diet for us. Yep. I love it. Can think they will be disappointed? Yes. Frankly, I do. I don't think we will. I okay. think it's all true. I think we yeah, I don't think it is. I don't think they can really like pinpoint the time of death to like within a second and stuff like yeah. that, like they do on TV. But I'm very excited to go and meet these people. Yeah, you've got to be open to it. I am open. your full title please full title yes hmm dr richard bassard mm -hmm. deputy director of the victorian institute of forensic medicine wow um, head of the department of forensic medicine at monash university and consultant in charge of identification at the institute so you left out odontology i did so that's my expertise is in forensic dentistry which is mainly identifying people by their teeth so whenever I hear that someone had to be identified by their teeth, it never seems like a good thing. No, no. So generally it means that someone is no longer able to be visually recognised by a relative or close friend. Mm -hmm. So they're either decomposed, traumatised, burnt uh. or skeletons. And You're right. the only thing that's left is their hard tissue. Wow. So why would you want to be that guy? Um, well, it's hectic. fascinating. It's, it's pretty fascinating. It's fascinating, but it's pretty hectic work life, isn't it? To go to work every day and be dealing with, with that? With that. Um, oh, I find it really interesting and fascinating. I don't um, find it morbidly depressing. Okay. Um, I find it scientifically interesting. I find it useful for the community. So I'm doing something to yeah. help people. And um, that's probably what, probably what drives me more than anything else. That is definitely all true, but are there never times when it gets on top of you? Oh yeah, there is. There is times when um, you kind of think twice about what you're doing, and usually when you're dealing with very large mass disasters, such as uh, Thailand, the tsunami in uh, 2000, and the Boxing Day tsunami. Yeah. And I spent a lot of 2005 over there, and it was just death after death after death for an entire year. And yeah. also when it's even closer to home, so the Victorian bushfires. Wow. when there was you know, 170 people really badly incinerated and most of those had to be identified by their teeth because there wasn't much else left. Yeah. So what do you do after something like that? Is that time for a family holiday or is that time for you to go by yourself somewhere and debrief? Um, generally it all happens inside my head with um, the debriefing bit. Okay. With um, a significant amount of support by people who you work with oh, okay. down the pub. That's okay. usually the best, the best treatment for me. Okay. Other people do different things. Other people seek outside help from counsellors and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, that's never really been my thing, so I don't do it. And I just like to look after myself. Okay. And I do all right. Yeah, you, yeah. you seem to do all right because you've been doing this for a really long time. I have. I and have. Um, you, you've got a family, you've got a nice life, you seem to be a pretty together guy. Thank you. You've got a great <laughs> sense of humour, you seem to be living a nice life. <laughs> You're a happy person. It's a bloody busy life, it's I know that. It's a very busy life, uh, yeah. Would you, what sort of people would you recommend this life for? I mean, if young people are watching these videos and uh, thinking maybe this could be a career for them. Oh, you know, if, you, if you've got a dental degree and this is the sort of area you want to go for, you don't think of this as somewhere where you're going to earn millions of dollars and have a Porsche every second week. Is that right? That doesn't happen. It's not a big earner. No, it's not a big earner. It's, it's crazy. It's it public feels, service. It feels like it should be. Yeah, well, a lot of important jobs aren't, yeah. particularly. So um, it's public service, so you've got to have a fairly strong sense of wanting to help your fellow man and yeah. your fellow community members. 
you've got to have a strong sense of wanting to develop nations that are less well off than you are because we do a lot of work overseas in helping in overseas disasters and capacity building for them to be able to do it themselves later on. Okay. You've got to have a pretty inquiring mind. You've got to, uh, obviously, the most obvious thing, not be bothered by the sight of death in all its forms. Yeah. Do you remember the first time you saw or dealt with a dead body? Were I do. You, were I you do nervous remember. going into that thinking, can I do this? I was nervous, but I never had any doubts that I could do it. Okay. But I was nervous that I would do a good job. I was nervous that I wouldn't embarrass myself. Mm. But once I got in there and started doing it, you get your sort of clinical face and then, then away you go. It's and an enormous responsibility, isn't it? No, it's, I guess it is, yeah, it is. It is, but it's a very enjoyable one and one I'm, one I'm proud of being able to perform. Well, I'm David Ransom. Mm. I'm a forensic pathologist. Yes. And I'm the deputy director of the Victorian Institute of Forensic Medicine. Okay. So we are all contributing to various aspects of life in the community. Yeah. And some people contribute in a very basic way, bringing up a family, doing a job, building the, the infrastructure of our community. Other people may win the Nobel Prize and leading lights in a whole variety of fields. It doesn't matter. Everybody leaves their mark. But in fact, how people die and how they came to die, that information itself also gives the community tremendous information that can help the living. So for example, we may look at a death that's occurred in a factory, um, that's occurred in the workplace, um, where safety of employees is a critical issue. We've seen disasters in recent times in Melbourne, a wall collapse, a crane collapses, a factory fire, someone getting trapped in machinery. These things should not happen. We know accidents will happen, but are they accidents or are they misadventures? Were they preventable? And what we do is try to gather as much information about the death so that we can find the threads, find the themes in that death that allow us to find prevention opportunities for a whole variety of agencies and individuals. How you live your life also depends on how you will come to die. Yeah. So there are natural disease elements. For example, we will identify things during an autopsy by looking at the person and seeing what diseases they have and saying, well, this disease may be related to lifestyle, it may be related to smoking, what you eat, it may be related to your genetic background. Mm -hmm. So you can go back to the family and say, your genetic background has given you these susceptibilities. If I can help you understand what those genetic problems are, we can sometimes put in place medical measures during the, your rest of your life to limit the opportunity of those diseases to start or to delay the onset of these diseases so that you are in fact um, it have a healthier and longer life. <laughs> Can you please tell us your name and occupation? Uh, my name's Linda Isles, I'm a forensic pathologist. Okay, that sounds very boring, but mm. actually, to me, you're like a rock star. <laughs> please tell everyone what you do. Okay, well, um, what we do uh, in terms of forensic pathology is determine cause of death, mm -hmm. but not only that, but find out how death occurred. But as part of that, we also like to think we have a fairly strong preventive role. So when we do medical examinations on deceased people, um, it's not just to find out why they died, but do they have some conditions that other family members need to know about that we can prevent them getting the same disease, for example. Short answer, you do autopsies. Yeah. <laughs> you do autopsies. Indeed, yes. And you are an expert specifically on brains. Yes, yes. So when other people are doing autopsies and they've got a brain that looks a bit dicky, mm -hmm. and I think that's the official term for <laughs> indeed, it. I'll have to remember that one, yes, actually. They go, get Linda down here. Yes, We've got a dicky right. brain. Yes, indeed. We need an expert to look at it. <laughs> that's right. See, you're a rock star. <laughs> you're a brain rock star. Indeed. <laughs> so sometimes you will go to a crime scene, for example, and then end up here in, what is this room called? 
So this is the main mortuary here? It's the main mortuary mm. and this is where you will end up uh, performing an autopsy on somebody? Yeah. Well generally if we've gone to the crime scene we'll probably be doing the autopsy in the homicide room. Right. Where so we do the suspicious deaths. Where the detectives will be watching it and, yes. and all of that. Yes. And so you will sort of take that journey with the deceased person all the way through and then you have this incredible responsibility don't you? Yes uh, because you only get one chance to do it and you need to do it right and particularly when cases are going to go to court um, you need to make sure everything is documented thoroughly and um, you approach things in the right order and uh, you document everything there is to document because you never know what questions will actually come up in court you know two years later. Mm. Um, I remember distinctly going to court for a, a young fellow had been hit over the head with an axe. Mm. Um, so he had two large axe wounds in his head with brain on view. Open. Um, and the main issue at court was a tiny abrasion like on his face. That was, that was the main issue in the case. And it was, you know, sometimes it's manufactured nonsense, but nevertheless, you need to be able to address that. So you never quite know what things are going to turn on. It's not actually sometimes the glaringly obvious things. Mm. So that's why when we do cases like that, it's really important to document everything, even if it seems insignificant at the time. And what sort of work have you done overseas? Um, so I went to work at the University of Glasgow for, for two and a half years um, as a forensic pathologist, but also to get some special training in forensic neuropathology, so the brain examinations. Um, but through my work here at VFM, um, we're quite lucky we do a lot of work with um, the Australian Federal Police. So um, I've been able to go to Thailand after the tsunami to help with the victim identification, um, to Christchurch after the earthquakes there. Wow. Um, but also from time to time we provide forensic services to the smaller Pacific nations because they don't have forensic pathology services. So um, I've done work in Nauru, which is particularly unpleasant. Um, mm. Vanuatu and the Cook Islands and um, recently I just did some work in Samoa with the WHO. So we're really lucky here because we have the opportunity to um, provide services to places which um, otherwise they just don't have that forensic expertise. Yeah, it's just a really certain kind of person, certain kind of brain if you don't mind my saying so. Um, I envy the person who gets to have a look at your brain eventually <laughs> because <laughs> it's a certain kind of brain who thinks that's lucky. I hope that's a long way away. I'm sure it is. <laughs> But it's a certain kind of brain that thinks that's lucky. It <laughs> thinks it's, you're lucky to be able to go to those places and those circumstances. I mean, most of us would rather never find ourselves in those circumstances. Well, one of the privileges of being involved in particularly some of those large victim identification exercises is it's a really multifaceted approach with lots of different team members. And, you know, everyone kind of works together because the common objective is to identify these people and give them back to their loved ones. And it's actually a real privilege to be involved in that effort. And you know, people go above and beyond um, to, to do what needs to be done under sometimes really quite trying circumstances. Um, but it's, it's really a privilege to work with those people and, and to ultimately, um, if we're successful, um, get the deceased back to their loved ones. Uh, my name is Dimitri Gerostomoulos. I'm a forensic toxicologist. What does that mean? Yes. So, for someone like me, in my the older, the, you know, the later stages of my career, it means looking after a service. But in my younger days, that meant actually, you know, extracting drugs from samples such as bloods, um, even more grossly, stomach contents. Oh wow! Or samples of liver, or other bits of tissue that is that are given to us as part of an autopsy. So, what can you do now? What's the latest? What can you? What can you tell us? What can you get from my hair, from my stomach contents? What can you find out? <laughs> well, if I access your stomach contents, it means that you're not, Which in, a you're good to, sir. You're not in a good place because you're usually here. Yeah. Um, unless you're in hospital mm. and they empty your stomach to find out whether you've taken an overdose of something. Yeah. But we can test hair, we can test beard hair, we can test eyebrows, we can test pubic hair, all sure. sorts of little bits of your body mm. that'll give us an indication as to whether you've taken a drug. Um, how much you've taken, whether that amount is going to be a problem for you, or whether it's indicative of someone who's got a drug, a chronic drug problem. Ah. Um, so depending on the application, depending on the sort of testing that we do, we can get different types of information. Often in an autopsy, we have a full complement of specimens. That might include blood, uh, urine, mm. the fluid from your eye, which is used to 
traditionally measure things like alcohol. Is it? Because when someone dies, changes start to occur in a body. And normally that means the production potentially of some alcohol, which may interfere with the presence of the real alcohol that's actually there. Mm. And the eye, which is an enclosed specimen, the fluid within the eye is protective of that. So that means that when we measure an alcohol concentration in the vitreous humour, uh, it gives us a better indication as potentially that that is more accurate than a blood sample, oh. which is exposed to bacteria, exposed to the environment, where you get a conversion of sugars to alcohol. Is that why drunk people and hungover people have bloodshot eyes? Uh, that's a different. That's a different um, oh. uh, phenomenon. Oh. Um, I thought I just made a great a, discovery then. No, it's wow. usually a post-mortem artifact. Um, but you know, people consume alcohol more than any other drug. So alcohol is pretty common in terms of the drugs that we find. Yeah. Followed by, unfortunately, methamphetamine and cannabis. No. So it might surprise you that 40% of our homicides involve methamphetamine. So these are the victims who are killed as part of the, the crime. Um, who are 40%? Taking that's quite prevalent. That's astounding to me. Um, that's an incredible statistic. What about uh, designer drugs? Like we read about that uh, a lot, dance parties and stuff. Is that a real thing? Are, they, are there new mm. potent drugs all the time? Yes. So since 2009, which is now almost 10 years ago, yeah. there was a worldwide shortage of a product called Safrol. What is Safrol? Glad you asked. It's a product that's used to make ecstasy. Oh. So there was a worldwide shortage of a drug called ecstasy, which people know. Never as heard of it. MDMA. But go on, sure. So for two years, there was really none of this stuff around. So um, there was the explosion of these novel psychoactive substances or new synthetic drugs. So things like spice, things like bath salts, which are really drugs that look like cannabis or drugs that look like methamphetamine. And since then, there have been about 800 developed which have led to all sorts of issues around the world, people being hospitalised, people dying from these things. But more recently, we've seen the development of potent opioids or painkillers or narcotics. Oh, yes. Such as the fentanyl group of drugs. Yes. Now, these are the ones I've heard of, and I heard that they were the drugs that killed Prince. Yes. Not only Prince, but a whole stack of others. Yeah. About 30,000 Americans last year, which is really tragic. It's and very tragic, but then when you hear about someone as rich as Prince, like for some reason that amazed me that someone with access to everything in the world would be using a drug that I think of as sort of cheap and nasty. It, that shocked it me. It used to be, well, it's still nasty, but it wasn't all that cheap. But right. now, main production of these drugs is from China and places like Mexico uh-huh. coming into North America mm-hmm. at very cheap rates and often lace laced with other drugs, so heroin laced with fentanyl, which is a problem, so you've got two opioids. Yeah. Heroin was already a problem. Something like fentanyl is 100 times more potent, so the combined mix of these things leads to all sorts of, of issues. Are people still poisoning each other as a murder, as a way to murder? Because I think you guys are way ahead of us now. I feel like 200 years ago you could poison someone and it was harder to figure it out, but now I feel like Dimitri would be all over me if I tried to poison someone. Uh, Yes, I think we are, mm. but occasionally there is a poison, there might be a poison used that challenges us. So, Like what? Well, I'm not going to tell, write- <laughs> I, I, I'm not gonna tell you. Um, these, are, these are challenges for us, but traditional poisons such as arsenic, cyanide, uh, some plant poisons, people drink, for example, pinoclean, uh, bleach, um, copious amounts of alcohol or oh, strange, yeah. strange liquids. We can detect most of those. Um, and with the technology that we have these days and the processes, um, we only need a small amount of sample. So when I started here, we were using one and two mils and ten mils of material. Now it's less than less than a finger prick yeah. of blood, which is used to screen for 330 drugs, for example. Wow. And that's done within ten minutes. So we are in your um, lab. It's a lab I share. Yes, yes mm-hmm. but it feels very intimate. I feel like I'm in your home. Mm. Does it feel like that to you? No, not no? my home. No. Although my home is quite cluttered, to be fair. Yeah. Yeah, but mm. you would spend a lot of time in here. Uh, 
Um, yeah, I mean, the role is one where I do casework as well as teaching and, you know, other work. So I'm not in here 24-7. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, you best tell us then, what is your name and what is your occupation, so please? My name is Soren Blau. I'm the Senior Forensic Anthropologist here at the Victorian Institute of Forensic Medicine. Hmm. I was surprised to hear that we needed an anthropologist. Mm -hmm. What do you do here? Yeah, um, it's a comment that's often made, well, not so much now, but it was when I first started about why on earth you'd want an anthropologist. Um, as you know, anthropology is an umbrella term, kind of includes anything from social anthropology through to linguistics and archaeology. But it's so nice of you to say, as you know, because yeah. I don't know that. <laughs> I don't know anything about anthropology. Yeah. I just think of it as the study of people, yeah, which is. I think is a That's definition right. I read in year it nine, is. and I've never thought about it again. Exactly. So mm. it is an umbrella term, and, and I think the confusion comes because of that sort of relationship to social anthropology, so living people. Yeah. Obviously, we're dealing with... Um, an aspect of physical anthropology, which is the hard tissue, so the skeleton. Mm -hmm. And that is essentially why a forensic ah. anthropologist works in a medico-legal context. So we look at differentially preserved human remains. Um, mostly the focus is the skeleton, but depending on the context, there might be um, you know, differentially preserved parts of soft tissue, skin, hair, toenails, fingernails that okay. survive. So, so what can you tell? I know that, for example, you have gone to war zones uh, and worked where there's mass graves. What, what can you tell from that? What's your purpose there? Um, most, many forensic anthropologists also have a background in archaeology. And so rather than, you know, working in pyramids and gold and that sort of thing, mm. we have skills around how to interpret a landscape. So it might be a question of, you know, is that blob in the landscape actually evidence of someone trying to dig a grave? So we use a whole range of skills mm. to help detect anomalies, what we call anomalies. And then yeah. we know that you can have an anomaly in a landscape from gardening, for example. We know we've disrupted the, the integrity of, of the soil. So we need to then decide whether that whole or that anomaly actually contains forensic evidence. That might be a body, it might be drugs or you know weapons, etc. So we then um, have specific skills to recover and in, you know interrogate that anomaly. So rather anyone can dig a hole, but um, what we try to advocate is that in investigating that anomaly with specific techniques, we can provide additional evidence. You know, we don't have to take 50 hours to move soil unnecessarily. We can work out where exactly a grave was actually created and so not dig elsewhere. And then obviously work out if it is an individual or individuals, um, the anatomy, how they were lying, whether they've got ligatures, whether you've got more than one individual in the grave. Mm. Um, and so you potentially can, you could help to locate a mass grave potentially uh, a war crime. Yeah, no, I mean, it is, it's an incredible privilege to work mm. in contexts where I guess people feel that there is going to be impunity. And I think, I mean, obviously the politics is massive and there are, you know, instances, circumstances where a huge amount of work is done and there is no justice, but often the justice for many families is, is identification. So, mm. you know, rightly or wrongly, um, it's not in a court of law, but for many people, um, you know, having their loved one returned and identified is, is as you can imagine, incredibly uh, important. Okay, here we are in the lab that sounds like a big fridge. That's what it sounds like, <laughs> Marion. Can you please tell us your name and occupation? Sure. So my name is Stadna Hartman and I'm a molecular biologist. Ooh. So I look after the DNA lab here at the Institute. Okay, so what does that really mean? What do you do? It means that we're working with very tiny molecules, mm. your DNA, and what we try and uh, look for clues within your DNA to tell us something about yourself. Yeah. In our case, we use it to help us identify deceased persons. Oh, okay. So, um, can you really sort of take hair samples and things like that, that like they do on TV and in movies? Yeah, so mo look, most of the samples we get are usually uh, from a deceased body, which mm -hmm. could be blood, tissue, bone. Um, we do help in some cold cases, and usually we get hair samples from those types of cases. Mm -hmm. But we can get anything from a tissue block that's been embedded in parafilm, because that's all that's left. What does that mean? Um, sometimes people have medical procedures done, oh. so tissues get embedded 
in paraffin and that gets I get stored for many many years oh and sometimes that's all the sample that's available okay what about in criminal cases where somebody's left their tissue under someone the victim's fingernails and all of those things again that we see on TV and in movies can you really solve a case that way? You can. Um, we don't do that DNA analysis here. So in Victoria, we actually have two labs. We have our lab that works with coronial cases, but there's also a police lab that does the DNA analysis for, uh, I guess, criminal investigations. Oh. So any samples collected from, let's say, fingernail clippings um, from a victim, they're actually sent to the lab at, at the police. Oh. So we don't deal with those samples, but certainly DNA can help. Different guys. Yes. So what can you tell about me from my DNA that you just took? We'll be able to tell, uh, I guess, have a profile for your ID. So if you ever went missing, we'd be, have your DNA profile yeah. uh, that we could compare, let's say, to um, a relative of yours to identify. Um, we can also do mitochondrial DNA testing, which tells us something about your maternal lineage. So mitochondrial DNA is passed down the maternal line. So you'll be able to trace your, I guess, maternal heritage using your mitochondrial DNA. Okay, so would you recommend this job for people? What, what, what sort of people would you recommend it for? Uh, well, look, this is a great job. I love what I do. Uh, I love the sense that we're doing something to help the public and families. So I guess that's what gets us up in the morning, uh, particularly those cases where I guess you can identify with uh, families needing answers or, or wanting to know what's happened to a loved one. Um, so I guess any budding scientists, you don't have to pretend, uh, you don't have to do forensics as such as okay. a degree. I mean, you could do a, a science degree. I get find what you like, uh, what discipline you're interested in, whether it be DNA, toxicology, or something else, and you can apply those skills to, to a forensic setting. And you like your job? I love it. Oh, wonderful! <laughs> So I'm uh, Dr Mel Archer, um, I'm a um, part-time forensic entomologist and um, full-time trainee forensic pathologist um, here at the Institute. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I feel like you're famous as an entomologist. That's, well, that's what I, I've been doing for 20 years, yeah. um, so medicine's actually only recent mm -hmm. and um, I uh, used to do this full-time. So entomology, um, so, would you mind defining what yeah. that is for us, please? So entomology is the study of insects um, and forensic entomology is the application of the study of insects to legal issues. And so in um, movies and TV shows and books, thrillers, the entomologist is the person who um, comes along and establishes a perfect time of death by using the insects, what do mm. you actually do? Yeah, so not that. Yeah. Um, no, absolutely not. And in fact, the reality would not make very good television or movie fodder oh, because okay. the reality is we estimate a minimum post-mortem interval. So there can be a gap between the actual time of death, so when somebody dies, and the time that the body becomes colonised by insects. And that is very common. Um, and the, the delay in colonisation is produced by just things like bad weather, night time, when insects aren't very active, or if the body has been um, wrapped, uh, say, in plastic or blankets, or put in a car boot. And these sorts of things are features of um, very many um, murders. And therefore, there's very often a, a gap between the actual time of death and um, and entomological colonisation. So when the, the maggots, usually it's the maggots that turn up first. Um, and that means that we can only ever estimate the minimum post-mortem interval okay. in most cases. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you can say this person has been deceased for at least this mm, period of time. That's exactly right. Yeah. In the majority of cases, that's all we provide. And there can be quite a gap uh, between the minimum that we provide and the actual time of death. Mm. And unfortunately, it's very unpredictable. So we can't even with the aid of research about what delays flies um, from colonising a body, even with the aid of that research, we can't be more precise about estimating that little gap. Yeah, it's fascinating. It's variable. It's variable. Mm. But you, I guess, is it one of those things that feels to me almost like an art form after a period of time that you, you, you become more experienced, you learn to factor these things in more and more, you 
get a bit of intuition about things. You definitely shouldn't do that. No, <laughs> See, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not. No, a um, no, no. Okay. Because when intuition takes over, it as you say, it's art. It's not science. Um, so no, we don't. We don't do that. Which, which oh. is often why what we do is quite. Um, uh, data driven and okay. therefore not that spectacular well, so no it's a very dangerous very dangerous witness who gets up there and um, provides art and in fact it's becoming increasingly clear across the board in the forensic sciences that you can be very led by context effects so mm. what you know about a case that you don't need to know to do your job um, say somebody told me as an entomologist that a person had been killed on such and such a date and then where I have to make decisions sometimes about which data set I use or um, about which specimens I analyse, I might be unconsciously guided in those decisions to help because of cognitive biases ah. in my mind to, to, to slot things into the facts that I think I know. So we're increasingly also trying to, to do things context free or admit when we've got yeah. context information to allow the lawyers to question us about the effects that that might have had in court. Okay, well, that was true. swings and roundabouts, I'm going to say. You know, some things were true that I thought they were going to be and some things were not. In a lot of ways, it was better than TV. And they're pretty quirky. <laughs> they're quirky people. Yeah. yeah. But really, it is at the forefront of science, yeah. forensic science, isn't yeah. it? It's where it's at. <laughs>